All right. Good evening, everyone. My name is Xavier Duran. I am the adult programming coordinator for the Lyle Library District. A couple of things before we begin. We are in what's called webinar mode, which means only myself and our presenter have an active camera and microphone. That means we won't be able to hear or see you. So if you're still in the middle of dinner or in your PJs, we won't be able to hear or see you. So uh, continue doing what you're doing. Uh, next, because we are in webinar mode and we can't hear or see you, if you would like to ask questions during the program, pardon, please do so um, in the Q&A section down below. Uh, you can go ahead and post your questions there and we will um, go in, uh, Jim, our presenter will go ahead and answer those at the end of the program. Uh, with that said, a couple of things. Um, I'm gonna talk about the Conservation Foundation. Uh, the Conservation Foundation is a private not-for-profit land and watershed conservation organization based in Naperville. Its mission is to enhance the quality of life by preserving open space, protecting natural lands, and Im improving rivers and watersheds. Nearly 4,000 members and over 500 volunteers support this mission in DuPage, Kane, Kendall, and Will County. So please welcome uh, Jim Klein Walker uh, for this program. Thank you, Jim. Thank you very much. So um, I've been doing this for uh, 17 years and was a volunteer before that. Uh, the Conservation Foundation is a wonderful organization that I work with. Our offices are in Naperville on the McDonald farm. And you're welcome to come down and visit. I wish you would. Uh, the farm dates back to the 1870s but updated with all these, what they call green infrastructure. So we put uh, green roof, solar panels, wind turbine, two different types of rainwater harvesting, the old time cisterns brought up to date. And we have all the native plantings that you'd wanna see, as well as 49 acres in organic vegetable production. So it's a cool place with history and all these green new features. A lot, a lot of things to see and do there um, right in the Southern Naperville. What I'm doing is trying to get the education across to private landowners. If you look at the second line there, 95% of the property in the state is private property. So if we want good conservation practices across the state, we have to work with private. And we work with individual homeowners, homeowners associations, park districts, um, schools, churches, pretty much everybody. And these concepts I talk about today can be applied to any size property, any place, doesn't really matter. And one of the things when I have been doing this, I realized that people want a reason, why should I do this? And the, the answer is it's better for us. Uh, in the picture on the left, I tell people I don't know where this picture came from and my parents don't know where it came from. I say, I'm hugging my little sister, what's the difference? But we all have had our natural experiences. And if I asked you where you enjoyed things more, you'd probably tell me about your mom's farm, family farm up in Wisconsin or used to go on vacation. Um, in this book by Stephen Keller, he, his quote is that we're not gonna be healthy and happy if we live apart and alienated from the environment. And it's true. I'm in this picture on the left, I'm hiking the Appalachian Trail. I guided my son to his first big muskie. And outdoors is where we came from. We were cavemen at one point and little house on the prairie and so on. And now we're in sky rise apartments and all kinds of indoor activities. And we're not outside like we were born to be. And we don't have time to get to the forest preserve park districts and all these places very often. So we need to have a little piece of that in our own backyard. My, here's my daughter's dancing in the Mediterranean at two o'clock in the morning, my son and his best friend. There's a lot of things that we do, including pets and gardening plants in our house. A lot of things that show us that we are connected to nature and we're part of it. We are actual animals. I teach at College of DuPage and my class is about animals and it shocks people to think, well, wait, we're not animals and we are mammals, we're homo sapiens, we are um, classified as primates. 
And understanding a little bit more of that tells us why we want to have these things in our yards that would bring us closer to nature. So what I do with the Conservation at Home program is I try to help people implement these practices in their own yards and have a little place where birds and butterflies are welcome. And you could have um, some grass and some of the things you're used to, as well as places for the wildlife to occur. Pretty simple things. I don't ask a lot of people and I give them this list, um, better water conservation practices, less chemicals, less grass perhaps, better soils and a more diverse tree population. And we've been over planting maples and honey locusts and that's not what was growing here when the settlers came, it was an oak forest and implementing some of those things to protect the oaks and replant some of the ones that have been lost. So, you know, feel free to shoot out if there's something crazy that sounds there, but um, I usually can get away with this as not that tough. In this quote by Bromfeld, um, there's a war on the destruction of our natural assets. I don't think anybody would argue with me on that, that you know, every place we see, we see the prairie has been dug up and the buffalo are no longer here and we paved over everything and we have Walmarts and new Amazon warehouses going up and there's high rise apartments along Lakeshore Drive where there used to be teepees and we're kind of ignoring it and um, we have to learn to live with what's going on because we're not going to go back to teepees along Lakeshore Drive anymore. So how do we adjust and live in this new changing landscape? One of the first places we have to begin our education is understanding that this is a plant-based planet. There is no life on this planet without plants. They're the only thing that can take sun and turn it into food. Everything we have on the planet from the air, the water, the atmosphere, everything came from plants. There are one of the reasons there's no plants on Mars is that there is not the hospitable conditions for plants to grow. And so plants are not there and thus they don't have hospitable conditions. So we have to understand that we're very lucky to have one planet that we know about in the solar system that is capable of growing plants. From the plants, everything else occurred. So we have air, plants give off oxygen, and they give off food for the bugs. The bugs have a host of things that eat them. And eventually humans came about and we eat the creatures that eat the plants and we eat the plants ourselves. And this is life. So once we understand that plants are life, then it makes a difference what plants we choose. For example, this hummingbird, he doesn't come for a cup of coffee or a chat. He's looking at your yard as, is there anything here for me? And if there's nothing there, he moves on. You never see him. So if you don't have hummingbirds in your yard, then it's because we haven't put things for them to feed on. It's very tough out there. They don't, you know, they, they're looking for food all the time. And not just hummingbirds, but a variety of other creatures are looking for something in your yard that, that they recognize and can get a food source from. The difference in these plants is evolution. So we see evolution in the animal world. We understand that there's a turtle, he has a shell that protects it. And we understand a cheetah can run fast to catch the gazelle. We understand a giraffe has this long neck to eat the high acacia leaves, but we don't see evolution in the plant world. It's not that visible. So you don't see these root systems going deeper than an oak tree. And the silhouette of human on the left and right at the foot of human is turf grass, which I'm sure you have in your yard and in, on the library property, but it does not have the root system. It's from Europe and it's not evolved in our landscape and it does almost nothing for our ecosystem here. So understanding if we choose those plants that we're not enhancing the ecosystem. So right now you've bought a home, you live in Illinois, you work in Illinois, you got kids or grandchildren here, 
And why aren't we embracing these beautiful plants of Illinois that do provide ecosystem services, they call it. So they're giving back to the environment. They're absorbing water, they're feeding the wildlife, they're um, cleansing water in many cases and holding the soil together and improving the soil. And how do we make those look pretty is the trick. This is in downtown Glen Ellen and they don't have any grass in the front yard. Now, I don't expect people to go to this direction this, this far. However, you can see how some people have done it in a very pretty way and they love it. That orange, by the way, right here is milkweed. And it's not the typical milkweed that you might see, but some of the tricks I teach about at COD and how to bring these landscapings into uh, what would be considered pretty and it's clumping. So you see here the black-eyed Susans in a clump and the, another clump of milkweed over here and this prairie petunia along the sidewalk. By these clumps, it looks more organized and having a pathway through it and it's lower profile. So we're not looking at um, a jungle. I'll show you more pictures. We've worked with people all over the region, the dark, the red in the center are the ones that I've worked on. We have sister organizations up in Lake County, the dark red and McHenry County, Cook County is in blue. And so it doesn't matter where you are across the region, we have people that can help you implement these things. Overall, we're close to 4,000 properties we've worked on and improved over the years. We have a program for non-residential sites. So it's not just your house, it's places like the hospital and right in, um, in Lyle, we've got places we've been working on and park districts in Lyle have been doing their share. So there's a lot of um, things going on now, hundreds of non-residential sites being um, applied. Park districts all have realized that much of their park land is not suitable for ball fields. So in this particular case, I'm standing on a bridge going over the creek and I saw a mink swim across the pond or this little uh, pool. And now as people getting older, there's very less of us are using the ball fields. And now we're walking our dogs or the stroller with the grandkids and enjoying these natural areas where we can see wildlife and the butterflies and the birds and in this case, the mink and enjoy an owl or a hawk flying by and understanding that the park district land can be part of the natural environment. This was one in Naperville when I went there, it was just a mud hole and they were saying, what can we do with this ditch? Well, the first thing we did was stop mowing it and don't put the tractor down in that mud. And we planted it. And now the new term for these ditches is a bioswale. So it sounds much nicer than a ditch. And it is place for little bunnies to go hide. Um, there's milkweed in there for the monarchs. We've got places for praying mantis or a snake to hide and enjoy nature. And again, if the park is not suitable for ball fields, why are we trying to make every area mowed? There's still plenty of place to walk the dog without having that low area that's gonna be all muddy anyway. These are just some of the plants we use on low profile. This prairie drop seed is a very nice plant. You can see it at the farm if you come out and it likes it hot and dry. So in this case, it's planted in a area between the sidewalk and the curb. This is that orange milkweed again, that's not quite blooming yet, but low profile plants that can take harsh conditions like this between a, a parking lot and a sidewalk. Very few things can grow in there. Certainly grass has a difficult time. And then this, this was a picture taken at the uh, fire department. And they said, nothing is gonna grow in this area. It's just too severe. And I proved them wrong. My granddaughter, downtown Chicago, my son and uh, daughter-in-law and granddaughter are walking and they found 
this milkweed that was stray plant growing in the side, not even planted. And here, right here underneath her finger is a monarch caterpillar. And the whole family was just amazed that a monarch could fly down into Chicago with all the buses and hustle and bustle and find that monarch or that milkweed and lay its egg on the milkweed and start this whole process going on. So um, it's an amazing process. I since then have gotten her a container and we've watched the monarchs hatch and she's got to see them pupate from the caterpillar into this orange beautiful butterfly that emerges in front of them and they get to see the wonder of nature right before their eyes. So common issues that I help people with, water issues, poor soil, bring more wildlife, um, more sustainable landscapes. People tell me all the time that nothing will grow over here or I can't get anything to grow underneath these trees. Trees themselves having issues. What are, you know, do we know that there are such thing as good trees and bad trees? and helping them identify things that they don't want to continue to grow in their yard and what to do to how to get rid of them. And then solving issues with these native plants that grow naturally. So they, these native plants have been here for 10,000 years. It doesn't matter if it's hot, if it's dry, if it's wet, there are things that can be applied to these sites and grow pretty much without a lot of inputs. This site, when I went to their uh, backyard, they said, you gotta see over here where the, the lake was. Well, there's no lake there now. And it was cracked clay, that is blue clay. The subdivision has been scraped off of the topsoil and very poor conditions to grow plants in. They can't grow plants there. And the, compo the um, organic material is missing. So, I explained to them that we need to add a compost bin, dig up some of this clay, mix it with kitchen scraps and leaves and all of these things and create better soil. So it makes our yards better, it solves problems. There are a bunch of plants that can take the variability of this site. So in the springtime, it's underwater and in the, later in the summer, it's bone dry. And many of these native plants are used to that type of thing. They're used to spring rain and summer drought. And I'm gonna show you some pictures of in the middle of a drought, how these plants are blooming because they've held the water from the spring. Birds are another thing, easy thing for me to sell. The top right and bottom left are both invasive species. They're from Europe and they don't even belong here. Um, starling and English sparrow, the grackle and the these down below are native birds, but they're out of control because of they've adapted to suburbia where we are yards and parks and open space. And they've reproduced to the detriment of other types of birds in this suburban environment. And we want more diversity. If I was to ask you, do you, do you like the, these pretty birds or would you like to see the native birds like these? but we don't even understand what they need. So this grouping will come to a bird feeder. Bird feeders are fine. They will bring birds so we can watch them and enjoy them. But we have to understand that we're not feeding these birds what they need for a full life. We can give them some snacks. We can help them through the middle of winter. Some of the birds like this hummingbird are long gone, but giving the hummingbird sugar water is not a sustainable food source for it. It's like me drinking a Pepsi. It may give me a short boost of energy, but it's not going to um, sustain me. And that hummingbird sustains itself through ants. All the birds in our area, all the birds eat bugs. And the bugs are on these native plants. So this grouping will come for a snack. This grouping will not come for a snack. Maybe you might get an Oriole once in a while to, to eat some uh, grape jelly, which is basically sugar again. But even this wren in the bottom right, we love wrens. They sing beautiful. A lot of people put a wren house out so they can hear the wrens. They eat nothing but bugs. And the bugs they want are in the 
um, leaves and debris in your plant beds, not in the grass. They can't, none of these birds can feed from grass. These birds are almost 100% bug eating, especially ones like um, this blue bird up here, tree swallows, 100% bugs. The cedar waxwing is like 80% bugs. It'll switch to uh, berries in the late summer. So if you have a service berry or viburnum, the native shrubs, it'll come and enjoy those berries. The warbler down the bottom here, almost entirely bugs and the kingbird, meadowlarks, 100% bug eating birds. So if we want the birds, all we have to do is plant the right species of plants. We're gonna bring the bugs, the bugs bring the birds, and that's how it works. We can also grow food right in the way of these plants. So this is just a, some of the plants that have seeds that the birds love. Right there, you're looking at a goldfinch eating on a black-eyed Susan. They love coreopsis, coneflowers, sunflowers. There's a native sunflower also. It's not just the big annual ones that you might plant. There are perennial coneflowers and um, sunflowers also. So that's one way of planting seeds for them. And these plants will also host the bugs that would help them feed. We've all heard the problem about pollinators and the monarch is the poster child. Everybody loves butterflies. So I sell butterflies. I tell people the most of the pollination is done by the bees. Like 90% is done by bees, but nobody likes bees. I don't have very few people put out like, can you make me a garden for bees? Um, no, we make butterfly gardens and the bees come along under the radar. So the bees that we're talking about are natural native bees, bumblebees, and they're not the type of wasps and hornets that sting you. The little yellow jackets that go on the ground that um, hover around your can of pop. That's not what we're talking about. Those are not native and those are the ones that hurt us. So these natural ones are work very well. They don't come after us. They just do their work and um, they're very enjoyable. So if you looked at the plants in your yard, how many of them are functioning, are native, and are working, doing something? These plants can be categorized into two categories, a functioning plant or a decorative plant. And this list here, all you have to do, is, if you're wondering about a certain plant, just Google and say, Google, where did the daylily come from? And it'll tell you where it came from. And if they're from all over the world, then they're not functioning in Illinois. So like lilac on the bottom, very nice plant, has a beautiful smell in the spring. It's nothing wrong with it, but you're not going to see bees humming around it and utilizing it. Same thing with roses. The list could go on and on. You may like them, you may want them in your yard, which is fine, but just understanding that they're not functioning. In our house, we start with function. We have the microwave, the stove, the refrigerator, the couch, TV, our bed, all those functional things. Then we add some pictures on the wall, a little rug, um, you know, some other things going on on the walls. Um, those are decorative pieces that we add on. And we need to think about our yard like that, like start with a functioning yard and then decorate around where you have your outdoor seating areas or something like that. Um, we're doing the wrong things. We fill our plants or fill our yards with non-functioning plants. And then we wonder why we don't have any birds and butterflies and waters puddling in the wrong places, um, all kinds of issues from changing the landscape from what it was for 10,000 years to what it is now. So train your eye to look at non-functioning sites. This one is, you know, really ugly. This is in downtown Naperville. And they said, can you fix this? 
well, I rub my hands together and say, this is perfect because this is the ugliest thing I can think of. So almost anything would be better than this. So if you change that, then you're a hero. We put a path. We want people to go into the prairie and see it. There's um, bee balm and there's some of that. Um, this is prairie drop seed down here. This is uh, wild indigo, very beautiful plant. It comes in white, blue, or cream. There's cone flowers back here in clumps, purposefully placed. Uh, that'll be full of pollinators and smell nice and a joy where you had a poor landscape. How would we apply that to a house situation? So these people called small residential lot They've got problems with it. They don't have any birds and butterflies. They have water coming out of the downspout that pours down onto the sidewalk. In the summertime, they have wet shoes. In the wintertime, they have ice. They have to put down salt for the ice. The salt kills the grass. And how could they make this yard more eco-friendly and better functioning? Notice the big arborvita overgrown there. First thing that went down. Uh, look at the beautiful brickwork that is now exposed. So some probably European craftsmen spent hours putting those bricks together in the stone. And that's now all revealed again. And much of the grass is taken out. The water is now directed away from the sidewalk to a lower area where it can pool over here. And native plants that like water are gonna suck that water up. But now the sidewalk is not the low spot anymore. And so it stays nice and dry. They make a defined edge for the grass and native plantings applied. So they're gonna have some birds and butterflies coming to their yard, less lawn to mow, win-win situation. Even if they were to sell their house, I think the curb appeal is much greater on this landscape. And this landscape is gonna require less work than the other one being that it was mowed and they had to fertilizer and pesticides to keep the dandelions away, those types of things. We're doing the wrong things even in our parks. Geese love mowed grass. They're fat, they're lazy. They wanna walk from the water on out. They need a long distance. They're slow to take flight. And their biggest predator is a dog, fox, coyote. And they need distance to see them coming and get into the air. So having these big mowed areas is perfect for geese, especially along a pond, but you've got problems. I don't wanna put a blanket down here and have a picnic with my granddaughter. You know, it's covered with goose poop. There's probably been applied um, chemicals because I don't see any dandelions or weeds. They've got erosion shoreline. If you were a fisherman, this is not a good place to fish. You don't want to have a picnic here. So what, why are we doing this? And I show people that the other problems that occur with some of these areas, long creeks and rivers, by having these grass with very little root systems, you're having problems, pipes break off. This uh, path up here is going to be in jeopardy as this thing begins to erode even more. And the natural solution to this would be how it was for many, many years when the settlers came to these ponds and rivers, they were all naturalized. Without that erosion, you will have no geese in this area. If they come at all, they'll fly in and fly out. They will not walk through this. It's just too dangerous for them to walk through this. You're gonna have diversity of landscape here. So the geese are gone, but you're gonna have heron and egrets and they'll be catching frogs and crayfish in the shallows here. This would be a good place to fish. The bass are gonna come up trying to eat the crayfish and bugs. You've got diversity of landscape here. So you have the place for the rabbits and the praying mantis and the beetles and all these different things that the birds are gonna feed off of as well as the seeds. Can I sell this to these homeowners? that would have to look out at the prairie instead of looking out at the mowed turf is the question. So people have to decide that they want this, but this is definitely a surface that works better, functions better than the mowed edges. We've been doing the wrong things about our lawns. Heavy nitrogen fertilizer. I used to sell fertilizer. 
This is nitrogen, phosphorus, and potash. Heavy nitrogen is not what your lawn needs. We're dumping huge amounts of it on. The grass can't even absorb it. It's running off into our rivers and um, streams. The grass with using nitrogen will grow extremely fast the top of the blade. You're gonna have to mow it twice a week. That's not what you want. You want healthy soil, you want healthy roots. And this is not a good mix for getting healthy roots, but Scott's and the fertilizer companies are telling you feed it. And we buy the $50 bag of fertilizer that just makes us mow our yard even more. And the grass doesn't do well with it. If you put this down now, you're gonna kill more grass than grow. So it's not something you could do in July and August, September even um, with this type of fertilizer. So we're doing the wrong things and spending a tremendous amount of money. One of the things that we tell people is some of the things you could do would be to grow clover in your grass. Clover fixes nitrogen in the soil and pollinators love it. And if you look at how what we're doing across the United States, we're covering the United States with grass. 39 of the lower 48 states have grass as the largest um, surface in the state. In Illinois, there's more grass than corn and soybeans together. And grass is not productive. It doesn't grow broccoli for the poor or give anything back to nature. And yet that's what we continue to put across all of our states. The states that don't have grass are either sparsely populated, desert, or mountains. A few of the states, um, Nevada or uh, Nebraska and Kansas here, are sparsely, relatively sparsely populated, and they're growing wheat and um, some other crops in large amounts. But it's the fact that when humans move in in large amounts, then they will flip it over to grass pretty soon as Nebraska gets more populated in Kansas, you will fill in the grass as they've been doing everywhere else. California is trying to get rid of their grass. They know that it's not good for their water issues. $40 billion we spent last year on grass care, 20 million acres of unproductive, biologically dead surface. So I'm not saying don't have any grass, I'm saying Maybe we reduce some of the grass area and save some of that $500 we pay per household on grass care and utilize it for something else. In this picture on the left, we have turf grass that's turning brown in a drought. On the right, we have the native plantings. That orange is milkweed again, and clumps of cone flowers and the grasses blooming in the middle of a drought when the other side is clearly diminished because of the heat and the dryness. These plants on the right are living off of the water they've stored in the soil and thriving in this hot summer weather. And yet we pick the left to fill most of our states. Trees are another thing. So we need more tree diversity. We didn't learn from the elm trees and the ash, and now we're overloaded with maple and honey locust. Bradford pear is another one that will be on the invasive species list fairly soon. Buckthorn, honeysuckle are both invasive species brought over from Europe and Asia. And adding diverse trees to our system is what is needed. The only real pine that is native is the white pine. And it doesn't get nearly the amount of disease that we're having with Austrian pines and, um, oh, they're having now problems with uh, the Colorado blue spruce, for example. Um, a lot of the non-native trees are coming up with diseases and things because they're put in unnatural conditions for them. So we're promoting um, tree diversity in all the communities. And grass and trees don't go together. So I went to this house, they have these beautiful white oaks. This is maybe 125 years old, never had grass underneath it. Not a good place to put grass underneath it. The Morton Arboretum tree places would tell you that they would take the grass out from 
anywhere in the drip line. And that's not always going to fly, but certainly grass does not do well uh, underneath in the shade of a tree and the tree doesn't do well. Many times they send their roots up to pop above the soil. All these beautiful leaves that are meant to feed the tree have to be raked up because of our precious grass. I can show you pictures of how these beautiful areas could be without grass. Here you're looking at Virginia bluebells here. This is wild geranium. These are sedges. They look like grass, but they aren't grass and they allow water to percolate down into the tree area where this is like a tarp around the tree where it doesn't get adequate water or air movement. And this is wild phlox and uh, trillium, geraniums, Solomon seal, beautiful native wildflowers that can grow in the shade. Runoff is the biggest problem we're having now in all of our communities. After about a quarter of an inch of rain, water will go horizontally and carry all this debris into the drain systems. So we're trying to use plants to absorb it, catch it in a rain barrel or rain gardens or these bioswales. And in this picture, we're trying to keep it where it falls. So in this site, the road is high or your house might be high. We have these drain systems. You might not live anywhere near the river, but we're all connected by these drain systems. And here we're just planting plants on the upside of this drain and letting these plants absorb it, clean it, keep it out of the drain system because once the drain system hauls it away, you don't see it dump, but it's going right into the DuPage River. And the DuPage connects into the Illinois, which connects into the Mississippi and all of our water is flushing away down to New Orleans where it dumps out into the Gulf of Mexico. And carrying all this debris with it. The Mississippi is one of the most polluted rivers around and it's from uh, the whole Midwest, uh, Minnesota. It starts the upper parts of Minnesota is where the Mississippi begins. And all of the uh, states throughout the middle of the country, you know, the Indianas and Illinois and Missouri, and they all feed water into the Mississippi. So that's what I'm doing with the Conservation at Home program is helping people implement some of these things I talked about today. We offer a program to come to your house if necessary and help you apply them. I have brochures, um, access to plants all throughout the year, and we do all this for free. We do offer, you can join the program, the club, so to speak, of people doing these conservation practices. In Lyle, there's dozens of people doing them already. And in Downers Grove is one of our biggest area, our biggest towns implementing conservation at home, but all the communities have homes that are people are like you that are working on their yards, trying to make things better. And um, here's my email and my office number if you have questions. And then um, if there are any questions, this would be the time that I can try to bring them up and answer them for you. So if you have any questions, go ahead and put that in the Q&A section. Um, one question that I do have, um, I, is there anything um, being done um, with golf courses which are notorious for uh, grasslands and all, or, or not grasslands, just having big fields with, with grass. Is there anything being done in terms of keeping it as a golf course, but also wanting to put into the those aspects of native plants into golf courses? Yes, um, we've worked with a number of uh, golf courses, including Cantini, uh, Village Green in um, Glen Ellen, Arrowhead uh, in Wheaton, Bolingbrook Golf Course, and having them apply um, less chemicals and some of the places are uh, using their uh, water from the ponds which is heavily nutrified and putting that back up on the grass and having it filter again so using those practices there's a number of golf courses that are now 
uh, creating habitat. And some of them are have Audubon certification. And we also have a certification that we can apply to golf courses, but that's everywhere. So it's not just golf courses, hospitals, corporate centers. Um, I'm working with Eco Labs now, which is on 59 and Deal, and applying these campus um, improvements for the people that are in there to come out and see these birds and see some of the acres of what was just mowed grass and turn them into prairie fields. Uh, one question that we have, uh, can clover seeds be planted in bare spots in the grass lawn? Yes, I you, I would probably tell you to go online and buy the clover, white clover, or um, I think it's called micro clover. It's a low profile clover. And you just rake those dead spatches or open areas, rake them hard so that the ground is is broken, especially if it's hard clay. Put down the um, seeds and maybe some loose soil or compost over the top of the seeds and water it well and it does very well mixed in the grass you don't have to do anything else oh a couple more questions uh, continuing on with clover, uh, when is, uh, I'm, I'm guessing, planting clover best to do? Anytime with um, clover is fine, as long as we're getting water. So like the worst time to plant would be July and August when we don't get any water. You'd have to be out there watering it all the time. So September is a good month. So I would say get it down as soon as you can. Uh, another question, do you work with the village of Lyle to make the village eco-friendly, in particular, the village sprays for mosquitoes and neighborhoods that seem to kill other bugs? What, if you have any contacts, uh, we try. We worked well with the park district. We have worked with the city in the past. We lost uh, some of the contacts we had at the city when they had some changeovers during COVID. So we don't have as close of a relationship as we do as we had in the past. Um, but we certainly are available to them and we reached out to, to all the municipalities in DuPage, Kane, uh, and Will counties to tell them that we can help you with things like tree diversity, like um, building more butterfly gardens. And at Lyle, we did a rain garden on the city hall property on the back side of it. So I know that they have some plantings on, on the uh, municipal site there. If we um, if we have you come out, is there a commitment afterwards to make improvements? No, we give advice. We tell you what would be better, what would work, and there's no commitment to do anything. You can join if you want. If you think this is a good way to go, if not, um, we just give the advice and and I give you my information. Say if there's anything more that you want, you call me. Uh, for someone who it's, doesn't have a yard, are there good plants for birds, butterflies that can be planted in large pots? Yes, there. Um, some people are doing quite well with um, called prairie in a pot. So you keep the lower profile things. Um, some of those sedges are a little green that you could grow in a pot um, and the flowers. I'm growing um, cardinal flower in a pot that has no drainage. But things like um, Coreopsis grow very well, um, depending on how high you want them to be. Black-eyed Susans would, would be fine. There's a lot of different plants that you could certainly could put in a pot if, if necessary. Another question, how do you convince people to limit grass in their yards? People seem to love their neat grassy yards. Well, I show them pictures like this at presentations and say, I'm not asking you to give up the yard. 
but if you had less yard and more planting areas, what sells them is birds and butterflies and flowers. So, you know, if you love that green grass, that's fine. But what if you had less of it and more flowers? So um, that seems to be the way, just increase the beds, let them come out a little farther, maybe take the grass away from the trees, especially if you love that tree. I go to people's homes and they say, oh my gosh, this magnolia tree or whatever it is, I just love this tree and say, well, but you know, I'm here as a tree expert to tell you that grass is the worst thing for around the base of that tree. So if they move that grass, they could plant flowers in there. And so that seems to, be, to work best is to um, tell them less grass, more flowers would be the way to go. Another one, are lily of the valley plants non-native? Do HOA not allow boating in their ponds to protect native planting? So two separate questions again. Okay, yes, lily of the valley is non-native. Um, vinca, a lot of the ground covers, English ivy, non-native. Um, again, you could have some lily of the valley if you like. You have to contain it. Like it will go crazy elsewhere if you don't contain it. So um, I tell people to limit it somehow by putting a, a timber down or something and say, you know, if you really want it, try to just keep it over there. I had some vinca in my yard, periwinkle, and as long as it stayed where it was, it was fine. But one year it started to take off and that was the end of that. So um, many of the ground covers we have, like Lily of the Valley, are pretty aggressive and, and will spread across the yard. In the way of um, HOAs, we do education. I do these programs for HOAs and I walk their areas. If the, if the HOA was built today, they would not be allowed to have grass to the edge. That's not even allowed anymore. The older ones have grass, but we're trying to convince them to start moving in the way of better. The problems they're having with geese, erosion, poor water quality. Um, right now, there are all kinds of algae and um, fish kills all kinds of brown, dirty, mucky water. Water quality is degraded in these ponds and right around their homes. So that's the reason why you'd wanna change it is to try to make the water better, which is adjacent to your house and is part of the values of the property. So there's a lot of benefit in going to these things. And so it always comes back to why would I wanna do this? And the answer is it makes life better. It makes it easier for us to grow things where we couldn't grow before. It brings us birds and butterflies that we enjoy. And it can help with property values. It can help with um, better landscaping, less water issues in our basements. A lot of positive benefits to going back to a sustainable landscape that works. Let's see. Uh, would the plants that you suggest be a lot of work to maintain? No. If you have a plant, a hosta, for example, if that hosta was gone and you had a clumping of wild geranium or woodland phlox, it's no different. Like right now, you have to weed around the hosta. There might be things popping up in the area around it, and it's pretty much the same. And there's no difference in cost. If you're gonna buy um, this plant or that plant, almost all the nurseries sell their plants by size. So if it's a gallon pot of a hosta versus a gallon pot of a native, the cost is the same. So the cost is the same, maintenance is the same. If you put mulch around your plants, that would be the same. You could still do that to keep the weeds down. Do you recommend paper bricks for walks and driveways? Yes, there's a, multiple things you can do, especially if you have water issues like permeable surfaces like that, that will allow that water to drain down through it. Sometimes they're more costly. You don't always get a chance to do that. If you're 
if you can't replace your whole driveway, that's okay. What we do is we walk the property and look at where that water drains. If it's draining out into the street, then we try to maneuver that. Sometimes it runs into the ditch in front of the house and we try to plant things in that front swale. So plant things that will absorb that water if it is running off and catch it before it gets out in the street and into the storm drains. Not everybody can, you know, if you're tearing out your driveway, that might be an option you look at. But for a lot of people who have existing driveways and stuff, then we just utilize the plants to do the best we can. Uh, would one of your team go to a townhome that only has a small area for a resident to plant? Yes, we go to almost all kinds of properties. We also, on some of the uh, condo associations, there is common area. So many of them, I just went to one in Downers Grove this week. And um, besides the little area that each individual person might have, there is common area that you're paying for that might be just mowed grass or trees that are dying out or things like that. So if you have any uh, connection to the board that runs the entire property. There's opportunities to save money and do eco-friendly plantings on the other areas. Even in homeowners associations, I'm working all over the area to uh, manage the common area. So whether it be some areas have woods, some have a pond, other areas are just mowed grass that we're putting in um, native plantings in detention basins or other areas like that. So there's a lot of opportunity, even if the, the individual site was small, the common area could be an opportunity. What would a for-profit company charge for the same service you provide free? I don't know that there is any people that would come out and give this type of service. So. Um, I don't even know how to answer that, but um, we're very happy. We have people that give us large sums and we have some that don't give us any and it all works out for us. So we're happy to be able to provide this free service and good advice to somebody. And one beautiful thing is that since we don't, I'm not trying to sell you anything. Uh, I'm not, you know, pushing fertilizer on you or something. So you get an unbiased advice. Do you feel bird seeds should not be put out except in winter? Um, the summer months, you don't really need it. So I would say limit it during the summer. You can change the bird feed if you like to feed birds still. Things like safflower and black seed oil. So I would look at the type of bird you're getting. When you start getting just sparrows and grackles, then it's time to stop or change the bird food. If you're feeding things like um, uh, niger seed, the black thistle seed, those are going to get finches. You know, if you've got good birds coming in, then that's fine, or hummingbirds or orioles in the spring and fall. But if you start getting the bad birds, the English sparrows, then it's time to stop. What experience do volunteers need to have to be a volunteer for your organization? We have all types of volunteers come in. Some do office work, some work in the fields, pulling weeds, um, a variety of different, you know, so we let people come in and say, well, what are you good at? What do you like to do? Because we understand that if you're volunteering or something that you don't like doing, you won't stay with it. So we try to have people do what they enjoy doing. We have people who are painting the barn. We have people um, fixing the driveway or repairing the door, whatever, you know, like all different types of skills that people bring along and we try to use them effectively. And then uh, how do you educate the neighbors concerning native plantings in your yard? We, everybody that, that I go and visit has an opportunity to get our 
uh, brochures and I give them to these people and um, in the brochure there's a beginning thing saying would you like to know more about this um, do you know anything about natives have you planted natives and then on the back it says call Jim and he'll come out for free so you would pass this to your neighbor and say I don't know if you know this or not but the conservation foundation will send somebody out for free to give you advice and um you know if they have things like buckthorn or these bad plants you can inform them about um things that they're doing that might not be the best thing or if they tell you that gee i'd like to have more birds or butterflies then it's an easy way to say you know there's a program that helps that you can earn a sign for your yard. Um, so if you had the conservation at home sign in your yard and saying, well, I'm trying, we don't, um, it's not like an exclusive thing where your yard has to be perfect or you don't get the sign. We're trying to say that I'm trying to do something better. My yard right now, I let it get away on me in the spring and it's got weeds that I'm not happy with, but the sign is out there signifying that I'm trying to do things in a more eco-friendly way and join the club, you know, let's all keep trying. So that's the, the way I work at it is I'm, I have a uh, marketing background. I'm a salesperson. I'm not a biologist, ecologist. I've learned along the way and I'm trying to change the habits from the traditional landscape to a more eco-friendly landscape. And I do that by selling the concept and providing the free help there's no more that i can do we always hear this phrase like well the least i could do was this well i'm turning that around and i'm saying you know the most i could do would be offered to drive to your house and come over and help you personally in your yard and if that doesn't you know if that offer to come over and help you free doesn't help it doesn't work then I've done what I can do. I've tried the best I can. Um, see another question. I know a busy family that would like to make their yard eco-friendly, but they might feel overwhelmed about where to begin since their yard is so large. So where to start? That's where I come in. We, we walk the yard and you start with the worst looking area. So they might have shade areas that there's nothing growing there now or a tree died over there or um typically i start out by maybe the back patio where do you spend your time where do you look out of your picture window and look out of the yard so if we fix the areas that they spend their time in then they get an instant gratification you know if this black swallowtail comes and lands on the plants while they're sitting on their patio everybody's happy if the hummingbird comes when they're out there with their granddaughter and they all get to see the hummingbird everybody's happy so we start with the area of your yard that is either the ugliest the most problematic or where do you sit out and enjoy your yard where do you spend your time outside in your yard and let's fix that first Uh, do you follow up months or years with successful clients? Well, the way I work it is, you know, we're busy helping people and everybody has my contact information. So I come and help them and give them advice, give them a list, plants, whatever they need, and then let them go at it. And I'm always there if you need to reach out to me again, say, could you come back over? I've, I'm, I hit this snag or now I'm ready to do the next section. So I rely on the people to reach out to me again and say, okay, I need more help now. Perfect. Thank you so much, Jim Klein Walker at uh, Con um, the Conservation Foundation. I believe you provide your email and contact information at the end of the PowerPoint. Um, so if anyone has questions, feel free to reach out. Thank you so much, Jim, from the Conservation Foundation for everything. This uh, program was recorded, so if you miss something, uh, this will be available in a week or so. Jim, thank you so much and uh, sure. for your time. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Good night.